So in the previous two sections, we dealt with polynomials and essentially trying to graph them. And it'll turn out that in these next two sections, we're gonna deal with polynomials and essentially try to graph them. So what's different? Why am I breaking these up into two different sections? Really, it's the starting point. If you think about what we did in the previous section, we were always given the factored form of a polynomial. For example, x minus one times x plus one times x plus two squared. When your polynomial is presented in this factored form, it's not too hard to graph. What we saw is we could start with the different x-intercepts. In this case, we have one at negative two for this factor, negative one for this factor, and positive one for this factor. And the multiplicities of those roots are one, one, and two respectively. And then from this factored form, we could kind of imagine what the unfactored form would look like. Let's see, we needed the leading coefficient and the constant term. For the leading coefficient, we could sort of think about this x times this x gave us an x squared, and this x squared gave us another x squared. So we'd have x to the fourth as our leading term. And then there'd be a bunch of stuff that we didn't even know what it was, and then we'd have our constant term. And just like we could predict our leading term from looking at the factored form, we could predict our constant term by looking at the factored form. It would be this negative one times this positive one times this two squared. So negative one times positive one is negative one, and two squared is four and four times negative one is negative four. What I'm saying is when we're given the factored form of a polynomial, we get an idea of what the unfactored form looks like, and then we'd use that idea of the unfactored form to get the y-intercept, negative four in this case, and the end behavior, that it goes up to the right and up to the left in this case. And with this information, we can kind of connect the dots, making sure to take into account the multiplicity at the different roots, because this multiplicity is even, I'm gonna bounce off the graph at this point. I pass through this root, but the multiplicity is odd, so I'm gonna go straight through. I hit my y-intercept at some point. I don't know where yet, because I haven't taken calculus one. My graph turns around, goes through this final root, and ends up pointing up just like the end behavior predicted that it would have. The previous two sections were dedicated to taking the factored form of a polynomial and coming up with its graph. What we're doing in this section is just making things slightly more realistic. Instead of starting out with this factored form, we're gonna start out with this unfactored form. And that's gonna be a little bit of good news, but a lot of bad news. If you start out with the unfactored form, it's really easy to figure out the y-intercept and the end behavior, because we don't need to predict what the constant term and the leading term would look like. We're already given those things. Unfortunately, that's not enough information to get an idea of what the graph looks like. So what we'll need to learn how to do is we're gonna to need to determine the x-intercepts from the unfactored form. And the short version of how we're gonna do that is we're gonna learn how to transform the unfactored form into the factored form. So really this section will be a lot like the previous section, except that we won't start out with the factored form, we'll start out kind of one step further back and then we'll learn how to change the unfactored form into the factored form so we can apply all the knowledge we learned in the previous section. But that begs the question, how do you go from the unfactored form to the factored form, and why didn't you just teach me this earlier? And maybe I'll answer those out of order. The reason you don't learn that initially is because there's a lot to know about polynomials, and going from the unfactored form to the factored form is really challenging. So why not start somewhere a little bit easier, namely the factored form, and learn all the different characteristics that you need to know about a polynomial from that, Rather than trying to take this process all the way from the start to the end, we kind of start in the middle and go to the end, and then start at the start and go to the middle so that we know the whole process from start to end. Anyways, how are we gonna do this? How do we change from the unfactored form to the factored form? Well, the short answer is we're gonna kind of undo this step here where we took the factored form and produced sort of an abbreviated version of the unfactored form. And doing that, which will be a little bit more manageable, will kind of provide us with the keys that we need to do the entire process where we go from unfactored to factored. That probably doesn't make any sense, so let me try to talk you through this. Here's a different polynomial in its factored form, which by the way, you could write two different ways. This first term could be two x plus one, or it could be two times x plus one half. If you take this two and distribute it into the parentheses, you produce this factor over here. I wanna think about it as this version of the factored form, and I wanna compare that to this unfactored form that I have right below here. As we've seen before, this 2x to the fourth power comes from this 2x times this x times this x squared. If you were to expand this all out, it would take forever. But if you're just worried about the leading term, it's not too bad. You just take the product of the 2x, the x, and the x squared. Similarly, if you didn't care about this negative 13x cubed or 25x squared or negative 8x and just cared about this negative 12, well, we could see where that comes from also. 
really it's just this one here times this negative three times this negative two squared. Negative two squared is positive four, four times negative three gives me this negative 12. In the previous section, we took advantage of this a lot that we can come up with the leading term and the constant term of the unfactored form pretty easily from the factored form. Hold on to that thought for just a minute because that'll be really useful. The other piece of information you need is to take this factored form and think about its different roots. So the roots come when you have x values that make this product equal to zero. So their solutions to zero equals two x plus one times x minus three times x minus two squared. I got a product of things equaling zero and that can only happen if one of these things individually equals zero. So if two x plus one equals zero or if x minus three equals zero or if x minus two squared equals zero. Over here, I subtract one from both sides of the equation then divide by two to get x equals negative one half. Over here, I add three to both sides to get x equals three. And over here, I take the square root of both sides and then add two to both sides to get x equals two. If, for a reason that doesn't really make sense right now, I really wanted these to all be fractions, I could say this three is really three over one and this two is really two over one. I know it doesn't make sense to write those this way, but stick with me, we're almost to the punchline. Think about where this negative one half came from. Well, it came from this equation right here, right. And the numerator, this negative one, came from when I subtracted one from both sides of the equation. And the denominator, this two right here, came from when I divided both sides of the equation by two. What I'm saying is really, in some sense, this one and this two are what produced this negative one half. And similarly, this three and the implied one in front of the x is what produced this three divided by one. And this two and the one that's in front of this x is what produced this two over one. The point that I'm trying to get at is, if you look at the factored form of these polynomials and you compare those factored forms to the roots when the roots are all written as fractions, we can kind of trace back the different pieces. This two, loosely speaking, produced this two and this one, loosely speaking, produced this one. The one out in front of this x, again, informally, produces this one right here, and this three produces this three right here. The one out in front of this x produces this one, and the two here produces this two. This is all very informal. I'm ignoring positive and negative signs. I'm not worrying about reducing fractions. I just want you to make the connection between roots written as fractions and the factored form of a polynomial. You're probably running out of patience, so let me try to tie this together. This 2x to the fourth right here is the product of this 2x and this x and this x squared, as we saw down here in red. So the two in this 2x to the fourth is the product of this two and this one and this one. But as we saw up here in pink, this two and this one and this one also turn out to be the denominators of my three roots. So this two, very loosely speaking, is the product of the denominators of my different roots. Similarly, this negative 12 that we see right here is the product of one, negative three, and negative two. And that one, this negative three, and this negative two showed up as this one, this three, and this two, the numerators of the fractions that make up my three different roots. What I'm saying is this negative 12 right here is, very loosely speaking, the product of the numerators of the different roots. If you can see a connection between this 12 and this two, the constant term and the leading term respectively, and these three different roots, negative one half, three over one, and two over one, then you can kind of get an idea of where this is going. And even if you don't, that's totally fine. The big takeaway is just this thing called the rational root theorem. And all it does is formalize these ideas that I've been speaking about very loosely up here. Essentially what the rational root theorem tells you is if somebody gave you this unfactored form of this polynomial that we see right here in purple, and then was like, one of the roots of this polynomial is five thirds. You could look at them and be like, no, nah, you're wrong. There's no way five thirds is a root of this polynomial. How do you know? Well, because if five thirds was a root of this polynomial, then three X minus five would have had to be a factor, right? The way you get the roots is you take the different factors and set them equal to zero. If we had three X minus five equals zero, we'd add five to both sides and then divide by three and get this five thirds as a root. So five thirds can't be a root because three X minus five can't be a factor. Wait, why can't three X minus five be a factor? Because if three X minus five was a factor, my leading coefficient would be a multiple of three. 
and my constant term would be a multiple of five. Think about where this two and this negative 12 come from. There would have been a three X over here and a five over here. So these would have had to be multiples of those numbers, but they're not. So this can't be a factor. So this can't be a root. You're like, okay, so now we're interested in what can't be a root. No, but because loosely speaking, the product of the denominators of the roots gives us our leading coefficient and the product of the numerators of the roots gives us our constant term. If we have a rational root, meaning a root that you can write as a fraction, it must be of the form P over Q, where P is a factor of the constant term and Q is a factor of the leading coefficient. So in this specific case, what I would do, if I didn't have the factored form, so I couldn't figure out any of the roots of the polynomial is, I take this unfactored form and I'd look at the constant term, the negative 12. And in fact, I'd ignore the negative for now because negatives kind of get lost when you multiply together different numbers. I'd look at the 12 and I'd ask myself the question, what whole numbers divide evenly into 12? What are the factors of 12? Well, one times 12 is 12, and two times six is 12, and three times four is 12. So I guess I get one, two, three, four, six, and 12 as the factors of 12. And then I do the same thing, except instead of looking at 12, the constant term, I look at two, the leading coefficient. And the factors of two are just one and two. Those are the only whole numbers that divide evenly into two. And then because of this idea of how the leading coefficient and the constant term are the products of the denominators of the roots and the products of the numerators of the roots, what I could do is come up with a finite list of possibilities of roots of this polynomial. What I'm saying is 5 thirds is not a possible root of this polynomial, but what is a possible rational root of this polynomial? Any of these numbers divided by any of these numbers. So one divided by one, two divided by one, three divided by one, four divided by one, six divided by one, and 12 divided by one. If I take each of these and divide them by this one, and then also one divided by two, if I take this one and divide it by this two, two divided by two, but that's already on my list, three divided by two, four divided by two, but again, that's already on my list, six divided by two, also on my list, and 12 divided by two, also on my list. I've lost track of the positives and the negatives, so maybe I denote that my roots could either be positive or negative, and I'd come up with this list. 16 numbers, eight numbers listed, but each one could be positive or negative. These are my possible rational roots. Wait, how can you have 16 roots? This is a fourth degree polynomial. Shouldn't it have at most four roots? Yeah, it doesn't have 16 roots. These are the possibilities for the roots. We already know what the actual roots are. They're negative one half, which by the way, shows up on my list right here. Positive three, which shows up on my list right here. And positive two, which shows up on my list right here. These are not all roots. They're just the possibilities for the roots. But what we'll learn in the future videos is how we can take this list and narrow it down to figure out which ones actually are roots. And that was a lot of talking and derivation, but the big takeaway is we'll be able to come up with possible rational roots without ever considering the factored form because the way we came up with these numbers just came from the 12 and the two that show up in our unfactored form. So this will be the trick that we use to come up with all of our different roots. But it's kind of a long process, so in this video, all I want you to be able to take out of this is what are the possible rational roots of a polynomial. And maybe to make sure that made sense, I'll leave you with an example. What if you were asked to list the possible rational roots of this polynomial that you see right here? It's an overwhelming polynomial, a little bit intimidating to look at, but if you ignore most of it and just focus on your constant term, the 25, and your leading coefficient, the six, and list each of their factors, so the whole numbers that divide evenly into 25 are one, five, and 25, and the whole numbers that divide evenly into six are one, two, three, and six. The only possibilities for rational roots of this polynomial are plus or minus any of these numbers divided by any of these numbers. So plus or minus one over one, five over one, 25 over one, one over two, five over two, 25 over two, one over three, five over three, 25 over three, and then finally one over six, five over six and 25 over six. 12 different numbers, but I don't know if they're positive or negative. So 24 possibilities for rational roots. It's a seventh degree polynomial. So at most there's seven rational roots. But before watching this video, we had no idea any number could work. 
And now that we've watched this video, we see that there's only 24 possibilities for the rational roots, the roots that can be written as fractions of this specific polynomial. If you can come up with that list of 24, you're good and you've learned everything I was trying to teach you in this video.